Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. This is a very uh, unique and different type of Code Club. It's not gonna be me coding, it's me giving a talk at the University of Michigan where I am a professor. Um, every now and then we get asked to give a talk at our own department, and that's what I did this past week on Thursday. Uh, I think you'll like it if you're interested in science and kind of the tensions that we have between reductionism versus holism. I am much more on the holism end of the spectrum. Um, and it, it relates to the research we do with the human microbiome. There's not a lot of data analysis in it, but at the same time, like I said, if you're interested in science and these types of debates that go on <laughs> among scientists, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Let me know down below in the comments what you think and whether or not you think we need to be more reductionist or more holistic. Thank you. So uh, at the beginning of the year, Kathy emailed me saying, Pat, it's been like 15 years since you gave a talk. Uh, you're due. And I was like, oh crap, what am I gonna say? Um, and so I got this idea and I've been kind of uh, workshopping it with Marcy over the past six months. And when the U of M won against Ohio State in the national championship, like I got my title. Um, and then Kathy asks, who do you want to introduce you to? And I'm always jealous of how our students introduce faculty when they have invited seminar speakers or each other for H12, so I thought I'll ask a student. And so thank you, honey, for the introduction. It's very kind of you. Um, so this is a brand new talk for me. Uh, I may never give it again, so um, we'll see. <laughs> so um, it's not as well practiced, perhaps, as the talk I've basically been giving constantly for the last 12 years. So you're getting something fresh here. Um, so uh, the team, the team, the team um, is a, um, a lift from a quote from Bo Schembechler, uh, historic coach of the U of M, um, who is kind of it when it comes to U of M. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you the quote later on. Uh, but as, as he mentioned in the introduction, that I try to take an ecological approach to things. Uh, when I came here, um, you heard a few weeks ago from Joe Zacular that um, he was my first student. And we actually came um, with, with uh, mason jars full of flower and flower beetles because we were going to study the microbial ecology of flower beetles. And after going to our first departmental retreat, that changed like instantly. Um, and so we've, but regardless if it's a flower beetle or soil or the human gut, we try to take an ecological approach, okay? And so as we go through, hopefully the idea of the team, the team, the team will make sense. And what you should know is obviously I study the human microbiome. And what I'd like to do today is share with you my critique uh, in a way of human microbiome research and some of the external reactions that we hear as microbiome research folks. And so one of the things that uh, we frequently hear, um, and many of you may hold this opinion, that's fine, um, is that microbiome research is uh, too descriptive and it's too focused on associations. And so we start seeing more and more of this chatter in more official <laughs> things rather than just in hallways. Um, and so things like um, RFAs from uh, National Cancer Institute saying that things that are not responsive to a particular call for applications include uh, things without testing a mechanism of action, right? So it's a constant critique about, against microbiome research, that there's no mechanism. Um, we also see calls for papers in journals like eLife um, uh, that basically is saying that we're calling for things uh, that provide mechanistic insight into microbiome function, right? Um, and then on, on Twitter, we see people quoting things that I've actually heard in this exact room at this exact hour that uh, people prefer to do experiment omics rather than say metagenomics, right? And so this is a quote from the 2011 International Human Microbiome Congress or something like that. So, um, so maybe I have a bit of a chip on my shoulder. Um, and then there's this very old quote from Ernest Rutherford who won a Nobel Prize in physics many years ago that science is either physics or stamp collecting. And so stamp collecting is about the most damning thing you can say to somebody about their research, right? And I study stamp collecting. I develop tools for stamp collecting that I've gotten over 20,000 citations. So I like stamp collecting. Um, and um, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about <laughs> perhaps is a little bit of a defense of that. And, um, and, and again, critique also, I think, of how we've been performing microbiome research. And I like to think in terms of analogies because although I look at data constantly and look at sequence data constantly, um, it's very abstract even to me. And so as a postdoc, I had a wonderful mentor, Joe Hamelsman, who encouraged me to think outside the box 
And so this is a paper that we actually wrote looking at microbial ecology, if you will, of various books using tools that we commonly use in microbial ecology to compare the community structure of those books and to see how they compare to each other. And so you can imagine each word in the book representing um, a different organism or a different species of organisms, and how often those words are used representing something about um, their abundance, right? And I was the father of some very small children and had read Goodnight Moon one too many times, and so that made it into this illustrious list of books. And so the metaphor that I want to use for today's talk is this picture. And so conveniently enough, this is a community of about 10 to the 5 individuals, right? And um, that we, we, we kind of have a general sense of how this works, right? And so if American football means nothing to you, don't worry. I've only been in this building twice and I was to get my son a COVID vaccine. Um, and I've never watched a U of M football game all the way through. Um, hopefully I don't lose tenure for that. Um, <laughs> but if you look at this community, how would we define health? Any ideas on how you might define health? for a community of 110,000 people it's on November, I guess you can't see it, November 25th, 2023, which was Saturday afternoon, right around Thanksgiving. Seats are full. Seats are full. I know this isn't your typical Thursday seminar, I'm asking you a lot of questions on the fourth floor. Did we win? Did we win? Is the weather good? Is the weather good? Okay, those are great. Um, so this is the Ohio State game. Um, so, did we beat Ohio State, right? So there's some people that that's the only measure of health that matters for a U of M coach. Um, did we end up winning a national championship? Did we end up uh, going to a bowl game? What was our winning, what was our, our win percentage at the end of the season? Were the, were the, were the seats full or not? Um, perhaps how many players were drafted into the NFL at the end of the season, right? So these are different measures of health. And, and this, I'll tell you, for a human microbiome is enormously challenging to define. Right? Because what we might define as health in one context is not healthy in another context. Right? Um, and remember that normal is perhaps not healthy. Right? Um, <laughs> this might not be healthy. Right? Um, and so if we think about health, and so think about it at this scale on this day of beat, beating Ohio State, there's 10 to the 5 individuals in there, plus or minus. Who is the most important individual in that community? J.J. McCarthy. Thank you, Dr. Galunas. Blake Quorum. Blake Quorum? So these are quarterback and running back? Those of you like me. Actually, no. Actually, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, not Harbaugh, right? At least not directly, because he's not here. He's sitting in the, in the corner. His metabolites are still there. His metabolites are still there. I won't, I won't do that study. Right, so um, um, you, might, you might say, well, there's 110,000 fans. Like, that's a big chunk of biomass that must be doing something in this community, right? Um, perhaps it's the, the, the defense, I won't say host defense, but the, the defense that of Ohio State that just didn't bring their A game, right? Um, perhaps it's someone like Stephen Ross um, or Uncle T or Connor Stallions who all perhaps had some role in kind of the Spygate controversy that involved the whole season, right? Um, and so, again, thinking about who is the most important individual, I think has a lot of parallels to this whole question of mechanism um, when it comes to the microbiome. And so, if we wanted to study this and figure out who the most important individual is, um, how would we figure that out? Take one away, so we could bench J.J. McCarthy, uh, right? We kind of did this with Harbaugh, right? Harbaugh was excluded. He was knocked out of the genetically um, or <laughs> physically, all right? Um, we could have placed the opposing team. I forget who they played before or after this week. doesn't matter. Um, and, or we could have them play across the street at Pioneer High School and see if having 110,000 people mattered, right? We could go back in time to 2020 and not let anybody in the stands, right? Um, and, and so we could perhaps change the weather. So it, I think it was a beautiful day that day, but perhaps it could start snowing and we could see what, if that, what effect that perturbation has, right? 
Um, but ultimately, what we could do is we could watch the game, right? So we could watch the game, and we could see how the players interact with each other and how the fans interact with the players. And perhaps we'd pretty quickly realize, like, maybe the fans aren't that important. They're not even touching the ball. They're not in and around the players. And, and perhaps there's energy, but how much does that really matter? Um, and, and, and we can perhaps... So I guess we should step back and say, like, you know, we know something about football and how it's played. Um, and so perhaps we could think about how we would not figure this out, right? So we, we probably would not <laughs> bench J.J. McCarthy, right? We probably wouldn't do, um, you know, we wouldn't probably replay the game in Chrysler Arena or at Pioneer High School. Um, we probably wouldn't focus on the abundant individuals, right? We probably wouldn't also do Koch's postulates, but this is a microbiology seminar, so here we go, right? And so to remind you of Koch's postulates, the organism should be constantly present in animals suffering from the disease and not found in healthy individuals. So, of course, this is dealing with disease versus health. And so I'm trying to talk about health. So let's maybe flip that, right? And so here we might think about, um, you know, organism, individual found with a phenotype. So, again, we're going to leave out Harbaugh. Um, but we might think about J.J. McCarthy or Blake Corum or Sharon Moore, right? So the next thing we're going to do um, is that that organism must be cultured, in pure culture, away from the animal body. Um, and so we could do that, right? We could you know, put them in the practice field or put them over at Pioneer High School all alone. And then when we put them back into a similar environment, um, they should be able to do the same type of thing again, right? Um, and then they should be re-isolated and and you know, we, we get the same phenotype back, right? So I'm thinking of perhaps someone like Denard Robinson, who I think was playing when I first came to the U of M. He was amazing and awesome, but the teams he was on were just never did much, right? And so perhaps he's someone that's really good in practice or in you know, shots of light, um, but in the whole context doesn't quite work, right? So my point here is that we wouldn't do something like Koch's postulates to show who the most important individual is in the, that community. And so, again, this is just way too complex. And if, if you want to hear good debates on who's the most important individual in this picture, you know, any Monday morning in the fall, you could probably turn on sports radio and get an earful. And so my working model <laughs> is that we have the team, we have the fans and the boosters, and that if the team wins, the fans and boosters will keep showing up and giving money to the team, right? And if the team is interacting with OSU, um, and perhaps that's like a special game, but I don't, as a, as a fan, I perhaps don't really care about the coach. I don't care about the individual players. Um, so if Sharon Moore next year wins a national championship, awesome. I don't really care who's the head coach, but that they won. Um, we obviously don't care about the controversy because everyone was very quick to defend Harbaugh here in Ann Arbor, right? Um, we don't care about the type of offense they're running, right? Whether it's a wishbone or West Coast offense or whatever, right? Just win, <laughs> um, and then we'll have a healthy relationship. Um, and I think this is replicated across the NCAA. And so there's many, many, many football games going on any Saturday afternoon in the fall, and they all have different coaches. They all have different players. They have permutations on playing styles, yet there are some healthy and some not so healthy uh, teams. And so it's not about the specifics. It's perhaps more about the relationships and kind of the general guilds or kind of roles that that people play and how they, again, interact with each other. So again, hold this in your mind. So again, this is compli too complicated. And so um, a, uh, another sport that is near and dear to my heart, um, and I think to this department, is women's rowing. Um, and some of you may not understand why, uh, but this is the 2016 Women's Eight um, at the Rio Olympics. The women, US women have won every Olympic gold between 2006 and 2016. Uh, they're just dominant, right? And so we might begin to think about um, this team and why these women, um, or the collection of women, have been so dominant, right? So is it, what defines their success? Is it the rowers, the boat, the fans, um, the training system that they undergo, the water, other teams, right? It's, it's probably all of these, many of these, right? Um, it, it could be that you have awesome mentors who let you go off and train for the Olympics and win a gold medal. Um, and so that's Amanda Elmore, who started working on a PhD in uh, 
graduated with gold and a master's, sitting in the front, front seat looking at us here. Um, <clears throat> and so Amanda was on a club team at Purdue, came to the U of M with Pibs. I said, sure, why not? Go ahead, train, play with, uh, row with U of M. <laughs> um, she held the U of M erg uh, machine record, as I understand it, which is basically one person rowing um, as fast and as strong as possible, right? Um, but they didn't win the national championship when she was at the U of M. Um, and, um, and so she's, you know, as dominant as she was, um, she couldn't make up for all the other things to bring a national championship, right? So her on herself wasn't sufficient, right? So again, thinking about that kind of idea of Cook's postulates. Um, and, and there's also considerable turnover in rowers that if you think about 2006 to 2016, um, there's a lot of turnover in the women that were in the boat, and Amanda was only able to race in this one Olympics. Um, and so if sports aren't your gig, you can think of other teams, so to speak. Um, and so this is my team. Um, and that you might think about this configuration as being fairly idealized. And by looking at the expressions on their faces, uh, you may think you know something about them. Um, and you may or may not be right. But again, this is everyone being nice. Look at Papa for a picture. And about, you know, one of about 10 pictures I took to get most people looking at me. Um, but then this might be them in a more natural system for themselves, right? And so again, again, think about microbiology and microbial communities. Do we study these communities in idealized situations? Um, or do we study them as they, they actually live, right? And so this is, this is a challenge, right? So in this picture, it might look like Simon um, here is the only one doing any work, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I can assure you that my wife Sarah is really telling everyone what to do here, um, as usual. Here's another team, right? And so these are the people that have worked in my lab over the past 15 years or so. And, and I would be hard pressed to say who is like the most important member of the team, right? Um, maybe it's the pig, I guess, which you can't see over here. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but really, I'm the one that gets to stand up and kind of give the summary story and, and steal their good ideas to um, get more ideas funded, right? And so um, I'm not the first person to kind of come up with this idea of thinking about natural systems, if you will, um, to think about biology. Um, but there's a great paper from uh, 2022 by uh, Lazovnik from Cancer Cell that basically is, can a biologist fix a radio or what I learned while studying apoptosis? Two things which I know nothing about. Um, I know what a radio is. I have one of these. I don't know if people still have radios or not. I tried to explain what a Walkman was to my kids, and they're just like... What? Um, but this is the inside of the radio, right? And so his idea was basically, if you looked at this and you knew nothing about radios and didn't have the schematics, could you figure out what the most important part of the radio was, right? So if we, this is again, getting silly and lots of metaphor and I'm perhaps torturing this particular metaphor a lot. Um, and so this is my view of microbiology right now, is that we can kind of lose the forest for the trees. And in some cases we lose the forest for a leaf or a stoma in a cell, right? Um, and so it's, again, kind of like football, um, that, that we're kind of losing the, the view of the football game for the spy plane um, flying across, which I didn't realize was like an inside joke, but that there was even a spy plane that flew over the game, right? So if you're just focused on the plane, wondering what's going on there, you're like missing the point of the, of the picture, right? Um, and so there's been kind of two general approaches that I've seen people taking um, to microbiome research and I think microbiology in general. So the first is what I'll call Cokes-based approaches. So we isolate and drill down uh, to specific genes and perhaps codons even while working at the bench or in some model system. Um, and so the mechanism that we discover through that context is, is specific, perhaps, but not at a relevant level, right? So this is kind of the the fable of, typically it's the, the five blind men um, filling an elephant and describing different parts of it, but through the wonders of Google, I was able to find one with lab coats, um, right? And so I would say this is important to understand the different parts of the elephant, but it still doesn't tell you really much about the elephant, right? And so still related to Koch's postulates would be like studying elephants, but in a zoo, 
right? So oftentimes people focus on we've got to culture bacteria and to study their ecology. And so again, we can perhaps learn things about elephants, but I think perhaps one of the reasons why the Detroit Zoo lost their elephants was because the elephants weren't doing well in a zoo, right? And so we're kind of losing something in studying and trying to understand the elephants. And so we can again come back another layer and study the ecology of these elephants. And so taking much more of an ecological approach to studying biology and studying elephants, say, in, in Africa and their natural ecosystem and seeing how they respond to predators. Um, this is lifted from an article talking about how animals sleep when there are things that want to kill them walking around, right? And so that's not something you're going to get in a zoo where, like, we protect little kids from knowing that there's predators, right? Um, and so I like to think that this is more along the lines of what we're doing with microbiome research. Um, and, and, and so I think that different sectors of society, even from like scientists to society in general, kind of approach these three different layers um, as well, right? And so scientists love to reduce things and look at mechanisms of things. And we talk about an early in life microbiota metabolite that protects against obesity by regulating intestinal lipid metabolism, right? And it's like, wow, that's it. If I figured, if, if, if I like, if I could get that metabolite, I will lose all this weight that I've gained from having all these kids, right? And eating ice cream every night. Um, but again, it's in mice. It's with a particular organism, bacterium lactobacillus, um, that lives in mice and is not particularly abundant. And jury's still out whether or not it's actually doing this in humans, right? So we have a very specific knowledge of this system, but how generalizable is it, right? That's, that's TBD. Um, society also likes this kind of silver bullet mentality, right? And so um, when I was a kid, I recall my parents going on the grapefruit diet in the 80s to lose weight, um, the Atkins diet in the 90s, Fen Fen, I remember as a grad student hearing about that getting pulled from the shelves, gastric bypass when I first got here, and then Ozempic, right? Which I'm kind of wondering if I could get some so I, don't, I could keep eating my ice cream, right? But we want these like silver bullets um, that science tells people they can have and when I kind of look at myself, you know, <laughs> my kids took, um, and I think about my reasons for, you know, doubling in weight over the last 30 years, it's, it's because of this picture, right? Like, I hate wasting food. That's, like, ingrained into me as a kid. Um, I have a fear of going hungry. I think I'm going to starve to death if I don't have seconds at dinner. Um, and... I, um, I love ice cream. <laughs> if you haven't gathered, I love Big Macs um, and eating them fast. Um, I like eating, right? I get stressed. When I get stressed, I like to eat ice cream or chocolate, right? Um, I don't like to exercise because I think it's boring. It hurts. Um, it's expensive to go to the gym, right? Um, and so these are problems that are really important. I don't mean to belittle them, but it's not a single thing, right? Like none of the things that we're interested in is ever a single thing. But I think when we approach things in science, we typically approach it as a single thing. And so again, we come back to the idea of the team, right? That it's not a single thing. There is no, Bo Schoenbeckler would tell you, <laughs> there is no single player that's more important than the rest of the team, right? Um, there's no one here that's more important than everybody else, right? Um, um, and and that's, that's the truth, right? That we all have things that we contribute to the team, um, for scholarship, when we look at problems, there are many angles that we can look at that problem. Um, so I've served on Stride through Advance for the last seven years or so, which is interested in figuring out how to improve representation in uh, higher uh, faculty searches, right? And it's been fascinating to look at people from across campus, from the humanities, School of Music, Theater, and Dance, me, um, Beth at one point, taking on this one problem and looking at it from different ways and kind of zoomed in and zoomed out. Um, and that's, I think, a very healthy way to approach things, and that we really can't winnow things down to a single problem uh, for any of the problems that we care about. And so now I'm going to show some data. Um, and so one of the things to keep in mind when we think about studying the human microbiome is that there is no one human microbiome. We are all different. So this group that studies and finds this metabolite in, in, a, in a mouse um, well, whose microbiome does that look like, right? Because everyone in this room has a different microbiome. And what we see in this figure is data taken from looking at um, 
uh, I want to say 300, yeah, 300 individuals who were highly healthy, not normal, but healthy. And they were then clustered into four different bins based on the type of bacteria in a fecal sample. And the different, you know, five of the most dominant or abundant, most abundant um, types of bacteria, and we see wide variation, right? So like the Bacteroides, um, in some individuals is really high, and in some individuals, say like in community type B, there's hardly any there. Yet these people are healthy, right? By many metrics. Um, and we, in this paper, um, Tao Ding, a former postdoc in my lab, and I went through about 16 or 18 different body sites that were studied by the Human Microbiome Project. We could then also look at the four different community types and see when these individuals were sampled multiple times, how often did they move between different community types? And so we would find that there are some community types, like B, um, where only 10% of the time did somebody stay in B after first being seen in B. But other groups like A, C, and D um, were the most stable, with D being the most stable, right? And so again, um, even within these three or four different community types, as you can see by the size of these error bars, um, these box and whisker plots, the rectangle is the um, 25th to 75th percent confidence interval, right? So there's wide variation in what is defined as normal. And so when we study, say, a mouse or one person, um, we're really looking at an idealized sense of that microbiome. There we go. Uh, still blows me away 12 years later. So this is work out of Jacques Revelle's lab at the University of Maryland, where they looked at the vaginal microbiome of women who um, collected swabs over, in this, this woman's case, um, I think every day for 16 weeks or every couple days over, every 16 weeks. And as this tetrahedron spins around, you can see this red ball kind of bouncing around. Um, and each vertex on the tetrahedron, as well as the center, is one of five different community types that they found across many women that they looked at. And why or where the community moved, they could not associate with anything. Right? So they look at things like menstrual cycle, um, um, whether on hormonal contraceptives, other practices. Um, they could find no association. So sometimes it sits steady. I guess it already went through the loop. Um, but it, it, the, these communities just kind of like moved around. Sometimes they would stay, sometimes they would move. And I recall a physician at a conference I went to standing up and asking Jacques, like, why, why, do you, why is there so much variation? This, this is abnormal, this is weird. And Jacques is French, he's like, it's ecology, right? It's ecology, like these are things, bacteria that are interacting with each other. Sorry for the bad French accent. But, um, uh, I've done work here with John Lapuma's group, who I think is now emeritus, although I still see him around, um, so he's not totally retired. Um, and so his group has studied the cystic fibr fibrosis microbiome. And one of the frustrations of this project is that they would recruit you know, 100 people with cystic fibrosis and get sputum samples from them serially over time, and there was no consistent microbiome that these individuals had. And if they're interested in like, what causes a pulmonary exacerbation, as shown by these black rectangles at the bottom, every exacerbation is different, right? And so again, how do you do that? How do you study a system that is so uh, variable, right? And again, it would come down to each individual is their own experiment. And, and that's perhaps not satisfying to people that want um, well-contained problems, but that's, that's the reality, right? Um, in my group, uh, we have been interested in colon cancer, in the colon cancer microbiome. And so these are, um, this is work done by Neil Baxter, a former student in my lab. And um, I hope you don't mind the, the GIF, um, but each line in the GIF represents a different person who has a colonic lesion and the, represent the type of bacteria in their community. And using machine learning algorithms, we're able to distinguish, diagnose people as either having a lesion or not, even though there's wild variation among people who have, um, have lesions in their colons, right? And so there's signal there, but it's, it's far more complex than one individual, one type of bacteria, right? And so the other thing that comes to mind when we think about this is that the scale of our lens matters, right? And we typically think that the finer the scale, the better, right? So in the microbiome field right now, there's a lot of energy about like, we should do everything at the amplicon sequence variant level, or we should be sequencing metagenomes, which basically means that we're gonna be looking at 
uh, the finest possible uh, DNA scale. And, and I don't think that's necessarily true or always warranted. Perhaps in some cases it is. So a former postdoc in my lab, Courtney Armour, looked at some of the data I just showed you and tried to analyze the community at different levels of taxonomic resolution from amplicon sequence variant, which we typically, people try to think of like at the species or strain level even, back to the phylum level. And then she built machine learning algorithms using random forest algorithm and said, how well do we do at classifying people as having a lesion or not? And so each, each of the colored circles represents um, a different random number generator seed, and this black circle is the, the median plus or minus the, the 25 percentile. And so what you can hopefully see um, is that amplicon sequence variance um, is not the best approach, right? And it actually does about as well as looking at the family level, which is fairly broad, right? And so we can also, say, peg the, the specificity at 90 percent, and then if we change, look at the sensitivity at a specificity of 90 percent, we again see that, you know, finer is not necessarily better. That even as wide as, like, the family level, um, so this would be like, instead of looking at, like, E. coli and Salmonella and Citrobacter, perhaps we're looking at Enterobacteriaceae, right? We're kind of zooming back taxonomically. And so again, if, if everybody's colon cancer is different, um, then perhaps we need to look at a broader level to find those broader mechanisms that we're not going to find by drilling down to look more fine scale. We've done some work um, on Marcy Balunas' favorite set of metabolites, the short-chain fatty acids, and, and we find uh, much to many people's chagrin, no association between someone's disease status with colon cancer and a short chain fatty acid, right? So the idea that, you know, there, that if we find these silver bullets um, of metabolites, then, you know, if we look at that finest scale, um, that that will help resolve our problems. And at least in our hands with our cohort, um, we're not, not able to find that. There might be other metabolites, and thankfully, um, Marcy has an open mind, and we're looking at those other metabolites as well. So a case study that I want to share with you and thinking about kind of this, this challenge between being specific and being broad or um, more focused in mechanism versus more general in mechanism, I think, is the, the question of obesity. And this has been a, a, a topic that has really captured a lot of people's imagination in the microbiome field and society. And I think, again, it goes back to this, this silver bullet mentality that if I fix my microbiome, then I'll just shed the weight. Right. Um, and so a lot of this kind of got started um, in coming out of the Gordon lab um, many years, almost 20 years ago now. Um, so Ruth Lay had this paper looking at mice who were genetically uh, predisposed to be obese. So I think the OB gene is a leptin gene. You knock it out and the mice uh, become obese. And so they did heterozygous matings to control for the initial microbiome. And what they found was that, um, that if you looked at the communities in these mice, they would cluster by, um, by genotype. Um, and, and that, um, well, first they would cluster by the pedigree and then by their genotype. And, um, and that they also found uh, a difference between the amount of Firmicutes versus um, Bacteroidetes, that the obese mice had more Firmicutes uh, than Bacteroidetes as a ratio relative to uh, the lean mice. And so, Again, this is what I'm talking about, looking at a broader scale. Um, and so, again, it's in mice, and this question is like, how does this play out in humans? And so, because, of course, working with humans, I'll totally acknowledge is hard, um, Peter Turnbaugh then took um, the microbiome, the, so fecal contents from uh, lean, genetically lean and genetically obese mice, and then fed that into, um, or, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, I think actually this is from sorry this is from human so um, from obese individual obese an obese human and a lean person and then um, fed those into mice and they found that mice germ-free mice who got the obese humans microbiota um, had a greater increase in body fat when put on a Western diet relative to someone relative to mice that received uh, a conventional diet and so again suggesting that this phenotype of obesity um, is mediated through the microbiome and could be transferred to mice. Again, it was one human donor. And so 
who knows how much that scales. And so we were interested in this question in humans and whether there was signal um, through the microbiome of a person's obesity status. So basically, if we got fecal samples from people, sequenced them, and then looked at who is in those communities, could we distinguish people as being obese or not obese? And so uh, some of these studies, so each column across this slide is a different study. Um, so Baxter is from my lab. Schubert is from my lab. Yeah. And then the other studies are other studies. And so what we did was we said, uh, we looked across this many ways, but basically we trained a random forest algorithm to predict whether or not somebody was obese. So in this first column, we would take Neil's data and we would then say, we know who's obese and not obese based on their BMI. And we could then train that model to predict obesity status. Uh, and then we would then apply it to the data from these other studies. And what you can see is that none of the studies did particularly well at predicting obesity status in the other studies. And when we look at things like diversity or this bacteroides and formicides ratios, none of it held up. Perhaps in individual studies it would hold up, but across the board, there wasn't enough signal there, right? And so this gets me thinking, or got us thinking, that like I, I, I believe the mouse data, right? But what are some of the reasons why the mouse data might not be translating to the human data? And one thought might be just that there's tremendous variation beyond obesity status, right? And so um, Neil, uh, sorry to put up the citation, um, Neil Baxter, when he was in my lab, did a study where we collaborated with people at EEB, mammologists, where they went up to, I have a daughter that went to Michigan Tech, so I can't call this Northern Michigan, but it's Middle Michigan. Um, and so um, to Middle Michigan, to the biological station, and live trapped paramiscus, which are field mice, and then got stool samples from them every time they captured them. And so there are mice that they captured multiple times from uh, two species of paramiscus that overlapped in their habitat. And so the idea of the microbiome is that like, we have selected for our microbiome over evolution, and the microbiome we have is the microbiome we have, and it's not going to be like anything else. And so what we found was surprising because, again, looking across the top, we saw no difference in metrics of alpha diversity between the two species. There's large variation, of course, um, in what we found in those two species. And in the bottom row are ecological distances, saying how similar or different um, these communities are. And that what we found was that with, among these distances, um, within the species, the distance or difference between the, the mice was pretty large. Um, and it's about the same size as the distance between species, right? So that would be like me and somebody else having radically different microbiomes. Um, this, is, this is actually a much larger difference than what we find in humans. And so that this, this, the distance is larger than what we'd expect based on these mice having been separated um, over ecological time. And I thought this was kind of cool. Um, the reviewers didn't agree. I mean, we got, it, we got it published in Applied Environmental Microbiology. But one of the reviewers' comments st has stuck with me since this was published, like, almost 10 years ago. Um, and and it's, that's how much, like, reviewers' comments can impact your work, I think. But this reviewer basically said that, like, well, if you put them in a lab and controlled everything, then you could probably see a difference between these two species. To which I said, who cares? Right? Like, I'm interested in how these, these mice and their ecology, their microbiomes, are, are out in the wild, where they actually live. They don't, they don't live in a lab. So um, basically what we're seeing is that all these other factors, like the environment, the diet, their health, is far more important than what species they're from. And, and I think that's, again, coming back to this question of obesity, is a question of scale. And you might think of it as like percent of the variation explained. Right? So perhaps there is a role for the microbiome in obesity. But I suspect, compared to everything else, the reason we don't see it in like our human studies is that it's just a really small factor. Right? So if you want to change something, if I want to change something, <laughs> I should stop eating ice cream. Right? I should probably go run um, and not worry so much about my, my microbiome. Um, and again, coming back to this idea of variation, um, when I first got here, we threw away the flower beetles, and Vince gave me some of his mice to start my own breeding colony. I had this question of like, well, what does the mouse microbiome look like? And so this is what 
assistant professor, I will just say a stupid pro assistant professor did, I won't say that about all assistant professors, was I went over to BSRB every day for a year, actually two years, and got a fecal sample out of a dozen mice. So Christmas, holidays, all the time. Because I was interested in how the microbiome of these mice varied over time. And they don't. <laughs> They don't, and they're actually really similar to each other. Even mice in different, different cages from the same breeding facility um, are pretty homogeneous. And so what we found in these blue lines is that in the first nine days post weaning, there was a fair amount of variation, but there's a lot of instability in the community. But when you get out to about five or so months, that day after day, and so this is kind of the, the difference in time between days and the difference between samples. And the solid line is um, one mouse compared to itself over time. And then what we found basically is like when we get out to the mouse being old enough, they, they look like their friends far more than they look, um, a lot like they look like themselves, right? And so, um, and again, this is in contrast to the paramiscus, where these distances, again, like later in life are like 0 0.2. Paramiscus, by the same metric, are like 0.9. Right? And so our lab mice, I think, are good for a lot of things, but they're really homogeneous over time and within the same uh, breeding facility. And so, um, and this, I think, there are other questions, I think, that come up with thinking about paramiscus, but one of them being that a lot of the things we see in paramiscus, we think should probably make a moss musculus really sick. Yet, whatever, the paramiscus seemed fine, right? Um, and so... I want to quickly go through a case study here. I know I don't have a lot of time. Um, talking about some C. difficile infection um, and kind of how some of these ideas relate to work in our own lab with C. diff. And so Alex Schubert, who is a former student in my lab who now works at the FDA, um, looked at about a couple hundred uh, fecal samples that were obtained from the hospital as well as from the community um, looking at C. difficile infection. And so the, the hospital samples were paired between people with diarrhea, but no C. diff, people with diarrhea and C. diff. And then we also had non-diarrheal controls for people out in the community. And so what you hopefully see here is that the gray dots in this ordination are the non-diarrheal controls, and they largely look different from people with diarrhea. And, but it's really hard to differentiate between people with and without um, C. diff that have diarrhea. Um, and, and so, you know, we often wondered, like, well, is a, is a diarrheal control really just a case waiting to get inoculated with C. diff? But we just, we can't do that experiment, right? Which is why we do mice. Um, and, and there's other epidemiological factors that come up in these types of human studies. So things like um, antidepressants or proton pump inhibitors or a variety of other medications people are on that the epidemiologists tell us are associated with C. diff infection. And so these are associations. We'd like to test them out in mice. And so um, working with Vince Young's lab over the years, um, we kind of jumped on their bandwagon of using mice as a model for C. difficile infections. And so this is work from Nick Lesniak, who followed up on a lot of stuff that Alex had done, where we can treat mice with different antibiotics, and we can then um, colonize the mice with C. difficile after the community has been perturbed. Um, and we can look at the different types of bacteria that we think are most important to allowing C. diff to colonize over time, or to perhaps in like the case of kind of low clindamycin and lower levels of cephaloparazone and streptomycin, might even allow the community to push C. diff out of the community. Um, and, right. um, and so we can then begin to think about testing some of these things, or the, the ideas from the epidemiologists in our mouse model, and so Sarah Tomkovich, a former postdoc in the lab, um, was interested in, well, what if we don't give them antibiotics, but perhaps give them PEG? We basically give them diarrhea, right? And so what she found um, in kind of this probably overly complicated figure for this talk, sorry, I know better, um, is that um, we could colonize mice with C. diff without using antibiotics by giving the mice PEG. And not only that, like they would actually stay colonized, whereas treating them with clindamycin, the mice could then clear C. difficile. Right? So we can begin to think about other factors that allow C. diff to colonize. So maybe it's not just antibiotics, but it's some type of gut perturbation that allows C. diff to colonize. 
Um, we can also begin to think about drugs and the effect other drugs might have as um, kind of um, uh, other factors that can help bring about C. diff infection. So one of these has been pro um, proton pump inhibitors. Uh, the idea being that perhaps PPIs are changing the pH of the stomach and changing kind of physiology of the gut and then allowing C. diff to colonize. And actually what Sarah found in another study we published was that omeprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor, and she tried, I think, one or two others, had no impact on sensitivity to C. diff infections, right? And so one question about this that is like, well, is the literature wrong? Did we do the experiment wrong? Like, why don't we see in mice what we see in humans, right? And so, again, I go back to the, the study that I did when I first came here, as well as other work we've done, and thought, we're using mice from our breeding facility, and so we're really looking at one person's experience with a proton pump inhibitor. We're using a lot of mice to look at that person, but um, we're not looking at a lot of variation in the composition of that community. And so in another study that Sarah had done, she bought mice from uh, four, other, four vendors and got mice from Vince's lab, um, which was the, the colony that we originally got our mice from, and then ran the mice through the model again. And what we find is that sure enough, like if we get mice from different vendors, they have different microbiota, and um, when given clindamycin, they clear C. diff at different rates, right? And so it's probably not enough to look at mice from only one breeding facility, that we need to build in diversity uh, into our microbiome. And so coming back to this ordination, one thought that we often had um, was, what if we could seed a mouse with many of these communities and run them through the C. diff model? And so Alex Schubert did this as part of her work, and she took uh, 15 uh, donors, um, fecal samples, uh, and put them into germ-free mice, and then tried to colonize them with C. diff without using antibiotics. And so M6 is the only donor uh, that had C. diff, so that's kind of our positive control, and we used its strain of C. diff, which is a more aggressive, more virulent uh, C. diff strain, um, to then colonize uh, these communities once they had established in germ-free mice. And the, the donors' IDs with the red boxes were people who, were, who had what you might think of as normal or healthy microbiomes, who were outpatient controls. And so the, the M designation on the right side indicates those mice that died after one day of being exposed to C. diff from the disease, whereas the, mice, the donors on the left side um, got colonized to varying degrees, but didn't die, right? And so, again, um, same strain to the same genetics of mouse, but different communities got us different phenotypes. So which community should we be studying? Probably all of them probably a lot more than these, right? But it's hard. Um, and so this again comes back to the team, <laughs> that this stuff um, is very complicated. And one of my fears about the direction of microbiome research and science in general is that instead of thinking about the game on November 25th in Ann Arbor, we're beginning to play fantasy football, where you kind of cherry pick players from a whole bunch of teams and they don't have to interact with each other but they're really good at whatever they do. And that's how we're kind of studying things, instead of trying to study things in the context that they came from. Um, and so I, I worry, um, for my own field and every other person's field, but mostly my own, um, because we're studying communities, that when we, when we extract one part of a community or team, we, we risk making a, a scientist-made fiction. And so what some of these things might look like <laughs> would be like studying the U of M football team based on their spring scrimmage, right? Like, I'm sure it's fun, we get something out of it, but like, there's limitations to that, right? Um, it might be like watching the football team play in Chrys Chrysler or the basketball team play at the big house, right? Like, it doesn't really tell us a whole lot because it's a totally different ecosystem, different environment than what they're, they're supposed to be playing in, right? We can also look at, un unfortunately, we can look at oddball coincidences, right? Like. I'm old enough to remember when I was at UMass um, that Michigan lost to this no-name school, Appalachian State, 
first game of the season when they were supposed to be like national champions, right? Um, and so that's like a fluke. And what people, like U of M people hang their head at this perhaps, but uh, U of M still finished 18th in the country that year and still had a winning record and still won a bowl game, which was actually, you know, Jim Harbaugh didn't win a whole lot of bowl games, right? So even though we have this kind of fluke event that's not indicative of like the overall season, right? We can also study people in isolation, like J.D. McCarthy at the Combine. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that go to the Combine and are awesome and then lay an egg when they get to the NFL, right? And so we can begin to think about analogies for these in microbiology and microbiome research. And so my conclusions, um, as if I haven't been opinionated yet, enough yet, um, is that we need to be clear about the question and whether or not we can answer it, right? So I started kind of with a bad question, like how is, what is the health state of this picture, right? Um, we probably want to be a little bit more focused than that, right? Perhaps we want to say like, well, what can we learn about football in general from this picture or lots of pictures like this, right? Um, one game probably isn't that important. I think it's really important for us to begin to think about like what percent of a phenotype are we attributing to whatever mechanism we're claiming, right? Like we can find all sorts of mechanisms, but how important is that mechanism in the grand scheme of things? Also, the arrow doesn't always point in one direction, right? It goes in many directions. That like the team winning makes the fans happy and brings more fans to the stadium, which then and, you know, perhaps brings more money in to name and likeness or whatever, the boosters or like the nice locker rooms that the, the players have, right? It's a big circle. Um, but we get so focused that there's got to be a one direction thing. And if you go to enough of these microbiome talks, and I've trained people to say this, we have a chicken or egg problem, right? Like what came first? And the answer is like, who cares? They're both important. You have to have both, right? To get more eggs, to, get, to feed somebody. Um, and so I think this one direction mode is, is overstated. Um, I think we should be studying bacteria and the host they're adapted to. I say this as somebody that studies C. diff in mice, um, when like mice, I don't think get C. diff. So maybe we should study horses, but I don't think horse people let us do C. diff in horses. Um, um, and, and I think we should be willing to embrace the complexity and context dependency of our problems and embrace the diversity of the systems and the organisms we're studying, right? Like we do a lot of work with say one strain of C. diff, well, you know, we should do a bunch of different strains of C. diff and how different, C, different C, strains of C. diff respond in different types of communities. But of course, this gets things to be, to be very complicated. So finally, I want to acknowledge my team, uh, at least on campus, <laughs> um, and the people that have been in my lab over the years. Um, I'm able to stand here and do the stuff I do because of the contributions that all of these folks have made over the years, as well as the many, many, many uh, collaborators that I've had um, since coming here and from before. And so if people want to read, it's actually really hard to read. I, don't, I think it's probably better to hear him, Sean Beckler say it live than reading because it's a little bit unintelligible. But the idea is that like, when you're in college, the team is what's important, most important. When you go to the pros, it's about money. Right? So, anyway, but the team, the team, the team. So happy to take any questions. Thank you. So the question was, I've talked a lot about the embracing the complexity and diversity as their value in simplifying things. And so, I mean, I would definitely, I think we need to simplify complexity to be able to say anything. But I, I worry that sometimes we, we focus too far down in on things, we drill down on a problem and we kind of fail to pull back and see kind of the broader context. Right? So if we start removing variation, like, well, what are those sources of variation? I mean, like for our mice, our mice eat the same thing every day, every meal. I don't eat the same thing every day for every meal, right? Um, but <laughs> we were controlling that source of variation. So what effect does that variation in diet, in just what you're eating? Um, like, you know, these are, I think these are, I think for everything we, when we simplify things, we need to understand what we're doing when we're simplifying things. Got it, yeah. Right, so the question is, um, to say like we study poop in humans and we can study other sites in mice like is there a disconnect there right like does does where we sample matter and i would say definitely um and my lab has usually studied fecal material because 
we want to get a time course where we can kind of connect samples. And so, of course, there are trade-offs. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, it might be that if you look at a different place, you see a different relationship, right? Like if we look in the cecum of mice, or if we look at the small intestine, we'd see a different result, right? Um, and so, yeah, we've done some of that. Like Caitlin Flynn, a former postdoc in the lab and also former graduate of our department, um, worked with a gastroenterologist where we did unprepped colonoscopies on about 20 people to kind of compare the ecology off over the colon. Um, and so obviously like there's limits there, like there's only so much you can say with 20 subjects. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think where you look is definitely gonna matter. Yeah, so the, the question is basically like how much of this is a sociology or science problem? And I would say, yeah. Like I think it goes back to that like physics or stamp collecting question. Like, like People want to be physicists. Um, they want to they want to nail something into the ground and say this is what it is. We want the precision that a physicist has. Um, there was a, a guy who used to at, that we, I would frequently see at microbiome meetings who run a sequencing facility and would say this this isn't rocket science. And it's, it's actually a lot harder than rocket science because we at least know where the moon is and we know where like Cape Canaveral is. But like when we do this, we don't really have an idea of where we're going. Um, and it comes to training, right? Like, so I'm trained as an engineer, uh, as in the direction. Um, we don't think ecologically about things. Um, maybe when we redo the curriculum, maybe we'll get more of that. But I, I, the, I, the other hat I wear is training people to do data science stuff. And people really are not comfortable thinking with complexity of data um, or quantitatively, which is kind of required. Um, I had a department chair at UMass who scoffed at the need for statistics with the <coughs> adage, which I think was tongue in cheek, like if you need statistics, you've done the experiment wrong, right? Which I think, I don't know that we see here, but there's vestiges of that across like biomedical research. And that certainly doesn't foster the complexity that I know you all see and we see. So I think if I'm getting it right, so basically if we take the metaphor of, um, Say instead of U of M fans, we gave all the tickets to Michigan State fans or Wayne State fans. Or different people in Michigan. Or just different people in general, or we perhaps we subbed out, subbed out the team and brought in a different team. Um, and so in some regards, we kind of did that with like the, the playoffs, right? Like there were a lot of U of M people there, I suspect, but it's a totally different environment. Perhaps we didn't change out the team. Um, over time, we perhaps changed out the team. But bringing it back to microbiology, you know, perhaps something like that that like just immediately comes to mind for some reason is like a fecal transplant. And so people who have a microbiome that's been assaulted by antibiotics or some other perturbation and then now are getting susceptible to C. diff, that if we give them someone else's uh, fecal microbiota, they can then exclude C. diff and not get recurrence. And it's such an interesting effect. It's like that because like, people have tried to come up with cocktails of like a handful of bugs or even one bug you can't exclude C. diff unless you have like a whole community. Um, so that's kind of along those lines, but um, yeah, so it's over time. But thank you all, and I'm, I'm around if ever, anyone ever wants to like yell at me or talk.